Now we will go to the third uh, speaker. Uh, this is Jun Ye, and he will speak about optical atomic clocks opening new perspectives on the quantum world. Les horloges atomiques optiques, de nouvelles perspectives sur le monde quantique. Jun Ye is a fellow of the National Institute of Standards uh, and Technology, NIST, and a fellow of JILA which is jointly operated by NIST and the University of Colorado Boulder. In his nearly 20-year career at NIST and JILA, he has become a widely acknowledged world leader in pioneering laser science and, uh, and technology, next generation experimental atomic clocks and ultra-cold quantum gases. His work highlights the increasingly important connections between precision measurement and quantum state control, from which many future quantum technologies will grow. Dr. Ye has invented world-leading experimental atomic clocks that tick at optical frequencies that have found a variety of applications. Dr. Ye. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first and only, thank you, President, for inviting me to speak here. What a great honor to speak in the, uh, this historical day for the worldwide meteorological uh, community. But I also want to say, as a physicist, this is a historical day for physics, for physical science in general. And I remember we have uh, high school students sitting in the audience, right? Uh, I, the reason I got into physics was because my first class in physics learned about units and actually liked it very much. So I hope some of you, you know, high school students, would come out of this conference being very inspired because this is what we do, being able to measure the physical world really well and be able to understand the meaning of the physical world around us. And I'm going to tell you um, a quick story around atomic clocks today. And the reason why I emphasize this is a very exciting time for physicist as well is because just working on a meteorological inst uh, a device of atomic clock actually opens many possibilities to understand the future technologies, future science, whether it's about controlling a super long coherence time for electromagnetic field, build next generation quantum sensors, being able to do physics on tabletop to discover new physics with that per perspective. We just heard the fascinating talk earlier that you can never take anything for granted until you make measurements. And as well as understanding complex emerging phenomena of a many body quantum physics. So the reason why we are celebrating today is this new definition of uh, SI units, where the fundamental laws and nature and the constants are now our units. Now, this is a really truly exciting time where these constants can come in and our units can become self consistent with each other. And you, you notice that this phrase has been emphasized many times. Those units we're building is going to be good for all times and for all people. And I noticed the one thing. Uh, if you look at the, the time that, that we, uh, we are not discussing at this particular convention of redefining time, but it w surely will be it's on the mind of many people. We already heard the exchange between uh, Dr. Rick and Dr. Uh, Phillips. And, and for example, if you look at this chart, almost all units, whether they are base or derived, can be traced to time. You know, these, these are some connections I've made, and, it, and, it, and you can tell where you have a fundamental constant, say, charge of electron, and multiplied by frequency, you get an ampere. So time plays a very important role. And if you take this, the French Enlightenment uh, to your heart, and you will translate this becomes time must be good for all times. <laughs> and that begs for philosophical reflection already. And I am actually going to tell you, in fact, this may not be true, really. And I, I'd very much like to reflect on the point that we have things where what's really exciting me f uh, most about the redefining the units based on fundamental laws of nature is it's now setting up opportunities for us to make new discoveries. And why do we want to do that? And that's because we know that our units are based on the so-called standard model. And the standard model is a, is a beautiful theory, explains 
most of the things we have seen and we understand about the, our universe, but it is incomplete. And it just as it's two examples I give you, we know that we have dark matter, dark energy. And that's something that we know they exist, we just, just don't know what they are. And those are unknowns in the universe. We know matter and antimatter are asymmetrical in the universe. Those are the things cannot be explained by the standard model. So, the, so you, can, you can take comfort that SI units are now connected to the, one of the most precise, well-tested models that we know of, but we also know that model is not complete. The, this is just talking about things which are unknown. We also know things which are known now, gravitational waves we know exist, and we can actually turn the, the measurement device to explore new science opened up by looking at the, uh, using gravitational waves as a telescope to look into the universe. So what I'm advocating is if we, the meteorological community, continue to advance, if we can build atomic clocks at the level of 10 to minus 21, 10 to minus 22, and you can build a network of them, it will become a fantastic tool, a scientific tool, to be able to look into the unknowns, such as we search for dark matter, dark energy, as well as using the known phenomena, such as gravitational physics, and actually look into the connection between quantum physics and gravitational physics, and so on. And these are the phenomena, these are the, the realm of uh, dis new discoveries that waiting for us to discover, and particularly for high school students, you are at the really right time, you know, another 10 years, it's a right for the opportunities to discover, because I think that it will take another 10, 20 years to get clocked to the 10 to minus 21, being a very optimistic person here. Okay, so since we're talking about time, uh, let me just give you a very quick, brief uh, history of the time scales. We know the universe is about 15 billion years, that's 10, 10 to the 18 seconds. We use pendulum, the quantum pendulum, to measure the time. Dr. Ulrich already used the, introduced that term. And it, this is basically the electron orbits around nucleus. And if I use a, a very canonical time scale to describe electron orbits, it's usually it's about 10 to the minus 15 second. We call it one femtosecond as a, as a period of this quantum pendulum of electrons swinging around the nucleus. This, the time scale from a microscopic quantum physics to macroscopic time scale of the universe spans 34 uh, decades, right? Uh, from 10 to minus 15 to 10 to minus 10 to the 18. You, if you take a geometrical mean, it's a 30 second. This time scale, which is very comfortable, as Dr. Von Clinton uh, emphasized, and you want to be working with something which it's a human, human activity. Science is a human activity. You want to feel comfortable of doing things. And 30 seconds right, right around the geometrical mean. What, but turns out we can identify atoms in the periodic table. And this particular example of strontium atoms, where we can find a quantum pendulum in atoms like this, where the coherence time can be as long as three minutes. Very much the same time scale of the geometrical mean between the age of the universe and a single swing of the quantum pendulum period. What does that mean? That means that this, this quantum pendulum, once you started, has this quality factor of 10 to the 17, or another way of saying that the period is extremely fast. It oscillates once every 10 to the minus 15 second, but you can keep track of that period for 160 seconds. And that gives rise to the possibility of counting that period to the, to the quality factor of 10 to the 17. Or translate that into something uh, on the time scale which is all across the, the universe, you can say that this is a, just a pendulum, my grandfather's pendulum, that swings once per second, but if you get that going, it will swing over the entire age of the universe. That's this device we're using to build a clock. And, and I want to mention, people have talked about opening the whole field of quantum science. Of course, quantum science has been with us already for one, more than 100 years. We are now getting to the point where we can really take advantage of all the classic textbook teaching of quantum mechanics and practice them in the laboratory. And I want to emphasize some, something which is rather trivial, uh, and which is the quantum certainty principle and the quantum uncertainty principle. And the, really, the metrology is making such a fantastic advances because to a large degree, uh, interplay between these certainty and uncertainties coming from the quantum mechanical, 
mechanical uh, principles. So taking the example of this electron orbits around the nucleus, we know that something which is extremely certain is those, those orbits are quantized and there's a discrete energy scale separating different electron orbits. And the energy scale is extremely well described. It's a set by nature. And hopefully this, the, the fundamental constants do not change over the universe. Uh, and therefore, this is a constant. As long as you measure, make your physical measurements really accurately, everybody should come up with the same frequency. If you put your population in the ground state or you put your population in the excited state, that is also extremely certain. You can actually make a measurement of a single, single photon, single electron, or single atom. This is all very certain. What's uncertain about things, which also sets the measurement uncertainty, is when you put things in coherent superposition between the ground state and the excited state. And that's because when you put something in coherent superposition, it is no longer a stationary quantum mechanical state of a particular Hamiltonian. And there's a, di di a dynamical phase that's going to evolve between the ground state and the excited state. And when we make a measurement, when we try to collapse that coherent superposition into a particular st measurement state, whether I'm uh, trying to determine whether atoms is in the excited state or the ground state, you introduce uncertainty. And that's really fundamentally is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that can be used to describe whether you would like to describe a wave function collapse or describing a permutation relationship, commutation relationship of angular momentum and so on. The, the end result is that we can use this phase as a time to measure as, as a clock time but as the phase evolves around the equatorial plane, as you put the atom into coherent superpositions, there will be a little fuzziness of the ball to tell you exactly where that handle is. And this fuzziness is the measurement uncertainty that's dictated by a quantum mechanical uncertainty principle. So the internal states, we're gonna take advantage of that. It's very certain, right? Because you have this certain energy level structures. What about the external degrees of freedom? So I just spoke about there's a quantum phase noise and we usually use the lasers to, to measure how fast this electrons are moving around the nucleus. And this is the quantum pendulum that I'm talking about. And it's difficult if, if, because we know that atoms are moving around and when they will have a Doppler effect and when the laser actually takes a measurement on the atoms, it can have a photon momentum being kicked into into the atom, and so there will be uncertainties that will be introduced into how you measure this quantum pendulum. And, and this is a really another revolution that's going on right now to introduce quantum certainty into our measurement system where all degrees of freedom, including the emotional degrees of freedom, now we are talking about external degrees of freedom, whether it's, it's how the atoms are moving around in space, how they interact with each other, all of these degrees of freedom, we want to be, ab be able to make sure they are quantized so that our measurement will no longer be limited by analog ways of Doppler shifts or frequency shifts due to the atom-atom interactions and so on. And if we can do that, then you can envision you can have thousands or many hundreds of thousands of those quantum pendulums all swinging in synchronization such that your measurement will be improved by one over square root of how many quantum pendulums you can measure all at the same time. And this is the, really the main point of my talk, is this being able to measure both the internal degrees of freedom and the, controlling the external degrees of freedom or in the quantum mechanical uh, certainty. And, and then you can put those together to really allow you to uh, reach the so-called standard quantum limit when you try to use devices like Atom to build atomic clock. So in order to be able to measure the, the ticks of this quantum pendulum requires to have incredible lasers. And the lasers that have coherence time over scales 160 seconds, as I mentioned earlier. And this took many years uh, of effort. People like pioneers like John Hall, Ted Hinch, and so on have certainly contributed to making sure the lasers can be as stable as possible. But even over the last 10 years or so, the, this revolution of making laser more stable is still continuing. It took a, a big effort of collaboration, for example, between PTB and the NIST. Uh, Jella is a part of the NIST. And, and uh, this work has been going on since 2007, when I was invited to PTB as a guest researcher. Uh, and this has resulted now using silicon crystal 
as a, as a structure to, to build the, the most stable cavity structure to support two mirrors that gives you the most stable lasers that's possible. So we have, we build two such systems, actually now by now we have four, two at PTB, two at Jella, and we can bring them together and then measure how good these lasers actually are. We can bring them onto a common photo detector and measuring the, the beat note between the, the lasers of PTB and the lasers of Jella, and here's a beat note showing a line width of eight millihertz, 0 0.008 hertz. Remember, this, the frequency is on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz. So this is giving you this incredible stability of four times 10 to the minus 17, just on the laser. If you translate this into the so-called coherence time, that we are not talking about optical wave that could be coherent for nearly one minute of time. And or another translating into the length scale, this would be almost at the scale of one tenth of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and this optical wave would be coherent. And this technology, along with the, the invention of the frequency combs by Ted Henshin and Jane Hall, has now essentially allowed us to be able to face coherently digitize the entire electromagnetic spectrum from the visible all the way to the microwave range. And this is an incredible technology that would allow us to actually measure the quantum pendulum swings of the atom and transfer that information into the microwave. We can use that as a clock. And I just want to recognize some beautiful faces, people, in graduate students and the postdocs in Jella. And we, you can see we exchange particles. They actually go to PTB and work with the Fritz Reeler and Uwe Stu and so on. Uh, and it, it's a really a wonderful 10-year collaboration now on this project. So with a good laser systems, now let's deal with atoms. And, and you can see you know, Bill Phillips is about to come up to the podium to give a talk. But this is the technology they gave to us uh, from the pioneers of the 1980s and 1990s of so-called laser cooling, being able to put light onto atoms in a, just a, a blink of eye in, in a few hundred millisecond time scale. So you can cool atoms from room temperature all the way down to one billionth of room temperature. So once these atoms are cold, you're ready to be able to capture them using the so-called optical tweezer technology. This is a pioneered by Arthur Ashking and, and, and the colleagues back in the 1970s, where you can use a laser field, polarize the atom, and the capture atom at the focus of, of the laser, laser beam. And the idea being you're creating uh, spatially independent, uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, energy, energy shifts of the original atomic structure. Therefore, when the atoms moves into the focus of the laser, it feels the pull into the, into the high intensity. And what we made a modification to technology like this is that since I want to use the, these two quantum states to build atomic clock, I want, we designed an optical trap such that when the atom is being trapped in these light balls, the frequency shift of the ground state and the excited state have been engineered to be having exact the same shape and form, so that even though the atoms have been trapped into these light shifted, light inhomogeneous stock shift, the frequency difference, separation between the two energy states are kept constant. And this is important to, to be able to, on one hand, hold on to these atoms to enjoy this very long coherence time. On the other hand, being able to not having to worry about the frequency shift caused by the, the trapping action itself. The simplest form of trapping is, in fact, just shoot a laser beam in one dimension and being reflected by a mirror. You form a standing wave. Everybody does that in interferometry. And at the standing wave, at the anti-nodes, that's where you have the maximum of the light intensity and the atoms can be trapped right there. And this will be looking like a stack of pancakes where each anti-node, you can have a dozen of atoms being, being trapped at the node, at the anti-node, and they can use these atoms to be uh, as your atomic clock atoms. So this is actually a very interesting visual realization of the Doppler effect that, that, that emphasized the point I made earlier, that everything should be quantum. So this is that the atom is already cooled to very low temperatures, one microcalvin, uh, and we are trying to measure the spectral width. This is the spectral width of a one microcalvin atom, and, and you can see associated with that temperature, we have a spectral width of about 40 kilohertz or so. That's a Doppler width of the one microcalvin atom being probed by light. Now, if you put atoms into this quantized wells, 
the atom can still move around if the well is fairly fairly shallow. You can still have a tunneling, and but it, what it, when you look at this the atomic spectrum, it already shows some some effect due to the fact that the atoms start to be localized by these individual wells. And all you need to do is then make the wells deeper and deeper, and eventually you can see really beautiful things uh, emerge, right? The central so-called carrier transition no, now no longer contains any motional effect. The Doppler effect is still there, but it's been now completely absorbed into the side bands. And the side bands comes from the fact that the motional states of the atoms are now fully quantized in these, in these uh, when, they, when you cool atoms down to the very, very low motional states, it, 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 it can absorb photons to go along the direction where you're not increasing the motional states or decreasing the motional states, such, such that that's your carrier transition that's beautifully free of any motional effects. But you can, of course, put a phonon into the system. This is a so-called blue sideband, where you can actually drive the transition from the ground to the excited state. At the same time, you drive one vibrational quanta along the, along the direction where you're quantizing the motional degrees of freedom. And that's what this blue sideband is. The red sideband is gone because the atom has actually been cooled to the absolute quantum mechanical ground state. There is no more lower ground state there. And therefore, this transition is gone. So you can see this is the first is a taste of sweetness when you quantize emotional degrees of freedom and you look at the transition here, you don't have to worry about Doppler effects anymore. And, and, and this is really the basis of the, the new generation of optical atomic clock where the internal degrees of freedom and, and external degrees of freedom are now fully separated. And you can do those measurements such that when you, are, when you can control a single quantum state so well, you can put multiple atoms in there and with the hope of building many hundreds of thousands of those quantum pendulums all together to allow you to improve the measurement precision of time by square root of how many number of particles you use. And it's just a very typical example. You can, you can see those beautiful Rabi line shapes that where you, you probe these clock transitions and use this, you can build clocks with uncertainty at a two times 10 to minus 18 level. And if you look at the, the picture of the, the evolution of the clocks, uh, this is the, the evolution of clock after World War II, the microwave clock, as well as the optical clocks starting in the mid-1990s. And they bisected it right around 2005, 2006. And this point on, the, the, the optical clock continued to advance with incredible speed. Uh, and I think we still have a couple of decades to go. I'm fairly confident you know, that the progress is going to be made in the next couple of decades that will continue along this line of a discovery and a technology evolution. And some of those clocks are not being taken out. I know in Europe, there have been clocks being compared between French uh, and the German clocks and the French and, and uh, UK clocks and Italian clocks and so on. And here, the uh, attempt in Boulder, we have uh, three experimental clocks in the optical domain. This is the Chela where my lab is. The NIST, we have a uh, utopium clock and a uh, trapped aluminum ion clock. And we connect them by both optical fibers as well as just shooting the laser beam in the air. And you can connect these laboratories and compare clocks at the, uh, between these laboratories. And, and over the course of the, the past eight months or so, the strontium utopium clocks have been compared down to now to three parts 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 18. And in order to do that, you actually have, we actually invited the National Geodetic Survey team to come in to actually measure the relative heights between Jilla and the NIST, which is spaced about a one, million, uh, one, one mile apart, and to, to measure the relative height to, down to a fraction of centimeters to be able to, the gravitational effect not contributing at the field parts 10 to the minus 18 level. But is it possible that we can go on to, to uh, along the 10 to minus 20? And I think it, the answer is, is yes. And the reason is that, that why I believe is that we need to do further quantization. So we have to quantize the motional degrees of freedom along z direction, as I, may, I explained to you earlier. But we should actually quantize in both x and y direction, as well as quantize the way the atoms interact with each other. If you have a dozen atoms in particular pancake site, they can rub shoulders with each other, they can cause each other to have frequency shifts. But if we can quantize them, then again, we can bring quantum certainty into the problem where we can solve these uh, systematic issues. 
So I, in the remaining time, I just want to tell you a little bit about the, the, the latest work using three-dimensional optical lattice and using quantum degenerate gas or Fermi, fermions loaded into these optical lattices to fully quantize all degrees of freedom and then see where, how we can uh, go from here in terms of the atomic clock performance. And the, I, the idea really is following the Pauli exclusion principle. If the atoms are being cooled to sufficiently low temperatures, you should have these atoms occupying one per site. And therefore, they are both X, Y, Z degrees of freedom, as well as how atoms interacting with each other will be fully quantized. And if we can do that, we could imagine that we put one million atoms in there, just have 100 rows, 100 uh, atoms in, 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 the, in, in the width, and 100 in height, uh, in terms of the, how many cells you have. And you, you put them together, you can have one million atoms with coherence time of 160 seconds. You will be able to realize a clock at a one second measurement time of three parts 10 to the minus 20. And if you average for 100 seconds, this will be at the realm of sensitivity where you can hear gravitational waves from atomic clock. Uh, so uh, to just give you a, a quick, some of quick ov uh, overview of the, the recent progress that we have made over the last two years on these three-dimensional optical lattice clock, here the atoms are loaded into the, a three-dimensional optical lattice. And when we, again, do this motion of side-band spectroscopy, now you can see there are three motional degrees of freedom are all quantized. You see three side bands that I was explaining to you earlier when you're driving the transition from quantum mechanical ground state to quantum mechanical excited state, both in, term, in terms of electronic degrees of freedom and emotional degrees of freedom are all quantized. So when you drive them, you have a carrier, you have a three blue side bands, you have no red side bands because the atoms have already been cooled in, in its emotional degrees of freedom to the quantum mechanical ground state. It looks like this. And uh, so this gives you the assurance. Now, if you say, well, since your strontium atom has actually nuclear spin of nine half, what if I insist that I give you a many different nuclear spin states, 10 different nuclear spin states exist in strontium 87? If that's the case, you can no longer have just one atom per site because atoms with different nuclear spin states, they are distinguishable particles. They do not have to obey Pauli exclusion principle. So you can have multiple atoms occupying the same lattice site with different nuclear spins. But when you look at um, energy level, uh, when you look at the energy spectrum of the clock transition like this, what you'll see is that you have a carrier transition, which is free of emotional effects. The interaction effect, when these atoms are interacting, they actually cause a very large frequency shift. And you can see there's, they can have two different configurations. One is EG plus, one is EG minus. That reminds you when, when two hydrogen atoms come together, they can form bound and anti-bound. All depends on how you configure the nuclear spins. So you can actually create so-called entangled states between the two atoms by just driving. For example, EG plus means the two nuclear spins anti-symmetrized and the two electronic spins is, is symmetrized and vice versa. But uh, the point I want to make is you can see now that interaction itself is fully quantized because interaction is no longer as a perturbations around the carrier and the interaction is very well separate away from the carrier. So when you look at the carrier transition, it's a free from Doppler, it's a free from any atomic interactions. And this is not a strictly true because as you go down to 10 minus 20, there will be other atomic interaction will come in. And that, these are the opportunities for us to make new discoveries. So with the system like this, we, for example, we were already achieving uh, a year ago coherence time of uh, six seconds. And in fact, we have now achieved atom-like coherence. You can put this uh, quantum pendulum in swing for up to 10 seconds or so. Actually, for up to 20 seconds, we can still see fringes. And the quality factor is eight times 10 to the 15. It's not 160 seconds that I promised you. And the reason is because actually the light that's confining these atoms in the, in the trap is, is providing a little bit of photon scattering, and that's limiting the lifetime. It's actually not limiting the lifetime of the atom living there, but it's limiting this, the coherence time uh, where, the, where we needed that coherence to measure the atomic clock evolution. So the solution is we need to build a, a shallower lattice. How do you go about that? You know, remember, this is a three-dimensional optical lattice, and I just use two 
uh, wells to represent that. And you see these are two atoms confined in the two wells. If I make the wells a little shallower, these atoms can still be trapped. In fact, we have, we have shown uh, these can be trapped for um, you know, up to 100 seconds or so. But when you have lasers come in and actually excite these transitions, the fact that the spacing between the lattice and the, and the, 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 the wavelength of the clock laser is not exactly commensurate will allow you to have a pick up a phase shift between the left well and the right well such that these two atoms now become distinguishable. And this is the, the conventional phase factor which is the e to the ika that we all know in electromagnetic field. And that means these two atoms become distinguishable and th that means that you can actually have a tunneling and that can cause problems. So the new technology we have in the laboratory, you can actually configure your lattice such that you can move those two peaks apart, two, two lattice sites apart, such that you're exactly matched with the integer multiples of the wavelength of the clock laser. In that case, when you drive those transitions, these atoms, regardless of where they are, they always swing in sync. And that, that means you can always maintain the indistinguishability between these atoms, and the tunneling will not be allowed. And we actually predict with the lattice depth of five recoil energy or an effect of 10 lower lattice steps, we can still keep atoms trapped. And therefore, this motional, this light scattering effect causing the, the finite lifetime will be totally gone. I think uh, I'm mostly going to be wrapping it up. We can put the clocks under a microscope. You can actually put a microscope there and look at the atom distributions. And this gave you the possibility of looking every, every clock atoms at simultaneously. And this, for example, the experiment we did is you apply a, a magnetic field gradient and you can actually see you know, the different stripes of atoms because they are responding to light according to their ZMF frequency shift. So the final slide I want to put it up is to just to get, get us thinking about it. Now that we can do this kind of, a tech, you have this type of a technology that can measure things so well in fact, the previous one that showed that we can, in a couple hours, we can measure down to two times 10 minus 19. So what if we apply this type of technology where you think about your 3D lattice sits in, on the surface of the Earth. The, this layer of atom and that layer of atom is only 10 micron apart. For 10 micron, the redshift is 10 to minus 21. Um, if we get into this point of 10 to minus 21 and so on, when the atoms, you put atoms in coherent superposition between the top layer and the bottom layer, whether you have a deploy waves so extending over this entire optical 3D lattice, the time is actually not very well defined because this proper time is in fact different. And this time is very interesting. It's very different from a magnetic field gradient in the sense that magnetic field gradient only acts on the spin. This time acts on both the, the spin degrees of freedom as well as the, the, the motional degrees of freedom after all, the gravitational effect is universal. And there, I think there's something to, for us to really to ponder how the quantum coherence is going to survive in the situations like this. And I think the atomic clock is going to probe areas like this, which is very exciting. With that, I want to conclude. I want to thank many of the collaborators and thank you for your attention.